He's after driving through the crowd here and hitting an elderly man. Now that's attempted murder. That's what the left is doing in this country. That's Antifa. This is these fascists who are trying to stop us legitimately protesting. They're prepared. They tried it at RTE on Saturday to drive over people. And now there's a man seriously injured on the ground. This is Carol Smiles, Rebel News, here in Dublin, Ireland. Now, the reason I've come to Ireland is because they're receiving record levels of immigration, with the Irish government even housing these new arrivals in hotels and also repurposing other buildings. Of course, this is an issue across the United Kingdom and even the rest of Europe. But here in Ireland, over the last four months, there's been an ever-growing amount of peaceful protests which have received very little mainstream media attention. Of course, as always, the very little mainstream media attention they have received has labelled anyone with genuine concerns about thousands of young single men being dumped in their communities as racist. The Taoiseach himself, Leo Varadkar, has said he is concerned about the rise of the far right here in Ireland. But is the so-called far right on the rise here? Or is it genuine concerned citizens worried about thousands of single young men being dumped in their communities without their democratic consent? Many of us Brits have watched from abroad as clips of the migrant crisis have circulated social media. Well, you might recognise these clips of young male migrants being dropped off at this office building, which had been converted into a temporary refugee accommodation. The footage showed coachloads of asylum seekers pulling up outside of the ESB building and quickly unloading passengers and suitcases before they were rushed inside. Since then, there's been months of continued peaceful protests in East Wall about the housing of asylum seekers in their community. I want to find out a little bit more about the situation in the East Wall part of Dublin, so I got in touch with local journalist Fatima Gunning, who's become a bit of an expert on that part of Dublin. So, Fatima, this looks like quite an elaborate government building, but clearly now you can see through the windows it's housing lots of migrants. Can you tell us a bit about it and, it's be and how it was repurposed? Well, up until a few months ago, it was an office building housed by the ESB, so it would have been kind of occupied from 9 to 5, Monday to Friday, essentially office hours only. Um, it wouldn't have been kitted out for like people to live there. Um, I've been told that there are as little as 10 showers here, and there's over, I think, 400 people living here now, the vast majority of whom would be single males. So again, like as you can see, it's it's not it's not something that's intended for people to live, especially not long term. So you say there's over 400 people in there. What is the actual maximum capacity of this building to house these migrants? I believe that it was supposed to be no more than about 380. Um, I've been told from a source living in the lighthouse apartments adjacent to this centre that that's now over 400. They've told me that they're just really concerned for their own safety, for their property value, for the safety of their families. I mean, I spoke to one woman who told me she had saved for up to 10 years to finally buy her own place. And I think she said as little as two weeks after that, this DP centre was just set up out of nowhere again with, like, with no consultation. So Fatima, you've actually spoken to the people or the residents inside the lighthouse buildings. What are the main concerns they've actually told you? One of the main things they've said repeatedly is, um, you know, concerns for especially fire safety. Like if a fire were to break out in this building, they say that there's no fire certificate in place and that does seem to be the case. Um, it hasn't been given a fire certificate to operate as a refugee facility. I actually confirmed that with Dublin Fire Brigade myself. They've also said that, you know, they're, they're, there's a lot of kind of antisocial behaviour. Several sources have told me that there is, you know, kind of drug consumption going on, especially in the underground car park, which is shared between this two gateway building and the lighthouse apartments. So that would be a cause of concern for them too. So the protests, which have actually been very peaceful, have gained a lot of momentum. Do you think they're actually having an impact, a positive impact for the Irish people? I think that the government and media establishment are realising that the protesters are not going to go away. I think that they're realising that like calling them names like race, racist and fascist and far right isn't really working. 
Um, I think that there, there are some signs, our, our Taoiseach Leo Varadkar recently said at an EU migration summit that people who are not genuine asylum seekers coming in here need to be stopped and essentially like repatriated to wherever they came from. Um, I think that's, it's a positive sign. Will it lead to real change? I don't know. Another direct provision centre called City West, it's um, it's up near Dublin Airport. It's been recently kind of stated by IPAS, the International Protection Accommodation Service, that they can no longer take new, new asylum seekers. And recently asylum seekers coming in here, the numbers are uncapped, have been told that they, they won't be guaranteed accommodation because essentially there is none. So you mentioned there the T-Shock saying that non-genuine asylum seekers will not be granted asylum and they will be f forced to leave the country. That's something the other side of the Irish Sea in the UK we hear quite a lot of, yet the numbers seem to keep growing. Do you think he's being sincere or do you think this is just another soundbite? I'm not sure. I think actions speak louder than words. Um, he only delivered that speech quite recently. Um, there has been no kind of government policy shift since then. We're still being told by people like Sinead Gibney of the Irish Human Rights and Equality Council that we have international uh, legal and moral obligations to keep accepting uncapped numbers of refugees and asylum seekers. And she told the Irish people that they essentially have to get used to that and embrace it. For months now, I've been personally following all the protests across Ireland, and this is because of a growing number of citizen journalists. They're having to do this because the Irish mainstream media won't. For example, tabloids such as the Irish Times and state broadcaster RTE often accuse those that attend these protests are far-right or extremist. So I was fortunate enough this morning to speak to Irish Freedom Party representative in Kilkenny, Luke O'Connor, who could shed more light about what the Irish mainstream media are doing. So we're not hearing much about the Irish immigration crisis in the UK. In your opinion, what are the mainstream media up to on the subject? Um, they're essentially activists. Um, our colleges are producing homogenous political actors uh, to act as our, our media guardians. Uh, and what they're doing is propping up the pro-illegal immigration government um, by not asking the hard questions. Um, like, it, it, it's ridiculous how in my town, Kilkenny, um, a tourist town that relies heavily on, tour on, the, on the tourist industry, that uh, we would allow our hotels to be taken up, multiple hotels be taken up with asylum seekers, uh, who we know a, a great proportion of haven't come here legally in terms of they're not actually asylum seekers, they're economic migrants. They've come here all under false pretenses. pretenses. And as well as that, um, we're footing the bill for their stay. So not only can we uh, not bring in tourists, uh, tourists in Ireland, for every one euro they spend uh, on a hotel, they spend 250 in local businesses. Um, so it's a double economic blow to uh, towns that have been hit very hard through COVID and are continuing to get hit. Can you briefly tell me about your ombudsman claim that you're putting in? Yeah, so um, the, I, I'm putting in two claims, actually. So the, the press ombudsman claim is more of a personal claim against the journalist um, who misquoted me at an event on Sunday. Um, she also, her demeanour... Um, was strange to say the least. She started arguing with us about uh, il the term illegal immigration and what it meant. Um, she attempted to take uh, a photo before our event had started of uh, our big banner and just me in front of it. So it was, it was she was trying to pull a stroke on, on Sunday. Um, all the state funded activists uh, from the government side were, were outside. And um, I actually got the paper today and she's had to back down, you know, she's had to say there were similar numbers on both sides, you know, because they're scared stiff now. I'm going to come after these people. Uh, Casey Lore as well refused to cover our protests, even though the government state funded protest was actually a counter protest to ours. The local radio station still didn't uh, publish anything about our event. Uh, complete bias, complete bias, you know. And... Finally, do you think these protests, which 
they're actually quite unique, the protests in Ireland, because they're gaining a lot of momentum, but every single one I've seen has actually been really peaceful, which you rarely see on these sorts of matters. Do, do you think they're having a positive impact on the situation in Ireland? For example, do you think it's actually forcing politicians' hands on the matter, or do you think it's going the other way? Yeah, see, like I've studied this this kind of populism stuff since I, since I was young, you know, and uh, it's interesting to me. Uh, Farage over in Britain always talked about David Cameron stealing his clothes uh, in a political sense. So the government are treading a fine line now. On one hand, they're saying that they don't want local people to be intimidated or coerced by the far right. Um, and then on the other hand, they are starting to make noises about enforcing our immigration law, which we haven't heard in Ireland for years. Um, it's actually amazing. They, one of the one of the minors, ministers last week, he, he sounded like Herman Kelly, you know? Um, so they're treading this fine line. Um, and we know from what has happened in America over the last 10 years, what has happened in Britain, as soon as they start to do that, they lose all credibility because they can never be authentic, uh, as authentic as us on the immigration issue. They just can't do it. So whilst in Dublin, I wanted to speak to those involved with the Irish freedom movement and to find out if they think their protests are making a difference. So today, on the outskirts of Dublin, I managed to speak to Derek Bly. So Derek, you're kind of unintentionally now seen as one of the figureheads of possibly Ireland's biggest resistance movement since like the Easter Rising. H how did you come about that? It all happened organically. I started doing some activism outside one of these centres that has been housing um, refugees and look, it grew from there. I've been doing it now with 12 months and it, it's like it's grown organically. What exactly are the people of, and I want to stress, like very normal everyday people, what are they protesting against? Safety, security, Housing. The Irish people have struggled with housing for years. Um, they, it, when you go on the council list, you're typically on it for 14, 15, 16 years. The, the, the houses that people are, are living in in Ireland are substandard. There's mould, they're falling down. But we have no problem in finding billions and billions of euro to build brand new modular homes for anybody that comes to this country and puts his hand up and says asylum. And what sort of impact are these protests having? Because they're actually quite unique in Ireland. Everywhere else in Europe and even in the UK, you see them get quite feisty, quite violent. Yet everything I've seen with yours, it's really peaceful. What sort of impact do you think that's having? Um, they, they are having an impact. The government are noticing. Um, they they are changing their wording on a daily basis. Immigration was never something the government right, was willing to address, but we see them now talking about sending um, right, the Gardaí to airports around Europe to stop illegals from coming into the country. Right, this is something right, they never spoke about before. Right, so we know they're having an impact. Right? And the fact that we're doing it in a non-violent fashion is making their jobs very, very difficult. They want to label us as extreme, violent, far-right, racist. And when we keep our protests uh, peaceful and uh, civil but disrupt, they really struggle with that. So where do you think the protests go from here? Uh, they keep growing, they keep growing, they keep spreading. Um, they're springing up all over this country and they're growing on a daily basis. They're happening in every town, in every village, in every city right, around this country. So we keep going and we keep putting pressure on this government and we tell them, you are not going to get elected the next time. You're not going to get elected. And, and if we have our way, we will bring uh, the people uh, that broke our laws to justice here in the future. So Derek is enthusiastic about the positive impact these protests are having. And the Irish politicians appear to be changing their tune on immigration. However, 
There are still many genuine concerns about the large waves of immigration in Ireland and what it's doing to people's safety. There have been reports of an increase in crime, with sex crimes in particular. We managed to speak to a young Irish girl by the name of Lauren, who unfortunately was the victim of a horrific sexual assault by a foreign national who was known by both authorities in Ireland and abroad for very similar crimes. So, Lauren, many people already know about that horrible evening, but briefly in your own words, can you just explain what went on exactly? So basically, I had just gotten, I flagged down a taxi like you would on a normal night out and uh, it turned out that I wasn't actually a real taxi. Um, I, don't, I got in a taxi with a foreign national, but I am in no way racist, so I didn't think anything of it. And yeah, they just, the events unfolded from there and that's kind of where we started. Do you know what I mean? And these events, from what we know now, actually could have been completely avoided because you're not the first woman this has happened to with him as the perpetrator. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, so basically I was the most recent victim that I know of, that we know of. Um, basically there was a girl bef three years beforehand and that was also in Ireland. They were looking for him via his uh, DNA. Um, and then I'm not sure exactly how long before, but there was also, um, he was also wanted for uh, crimes of a sexual nature in both Austria and France. So he was wanted and he came into this country and he was able to get more victims. So talk to me about this so-called taxi. It had fake plates. He wasn't actually a taxi driver, was he? No, so basically he had everything the same. He had the, the pl he had the plates, he had the sticker on the sides. He also had the sign on the top that lights up. He also had, you know, when you get inside the taxi, the little thing with their, like, their taxi number and stuff. So that was obviously fake because he wasn't registered. Um, so, yeah, so all of it was fake. What's happened to him now? Um, he's at the, uh, serving his first year of 17 and a half years. So he's another 16 and a half years to save now. And if it's not too personal, what do you think about that sort of sentencing? Because when you see these crimes happen to people, for the victim, it's a life sentence. Do, 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 you, do you think he's got off lightly or do you, do you think they should make a bigger stand on these things? Well, to be honest with you, like, I do think I was happy enough with that because a lot of times they could get a much lesser sentence and the only reason why he got such a high sentence was for false imprisonment, which is the highest charge you can actually get in this country, higher than rape, which is absolutely ridiculous. To be honest with you, I wouldn't have become a victim either with the other victims if there was background checking and guard event, which I think is so important. Have you received an apology? Because, again, th this... This could have been easily avoided had the border control simply done their job. No, they haven't, and no disrespect to anybody involved, but at the end of the day, I'm not very happy because this shouldn't have happened to me and it shouldn't have happened to the other victim, to anybody. Like, But it could have been avoided if uh, he had been background checked, so um, I just feel let down, to be honest with you. Because like, my, my son could have lost out on his mother, do you know what I mean? So, Lauren, thank you for taking the time for talking to us today, and hopefully this horrible ordeal that you've been through actually has a positive outcome and your story can help prevent this happen to other girls in the future thank you very much for having me and um i just to be honest with you i just really want to help as many women and girls and even men that i can because look there's still uh, it's still normal that there's no background check and there's no guard event and so look sadly i probably won't be the last victim there's probably going to be a lot more till this issue is addressed so I just hope that now me coming forward will help prevent or at least show awareness so people know to protect themselves more and take the measures that they have to. It was good to see Lauren coping so well and being so strong when it comes to telling her story in the hope that it will help others. But essentially, this horrible situation could have been avoided had the Irish authorities just done proper background checks. So we know Ireland has seen a large influx of young single men into the country and I thought I'd take the time to show you just a few things that have been circulating on social media recently. One example is this video. It shows an African migrant coming into a closed office and asking for money and cigarettes. After being told there was none in the building by the office ladies, he decided to insult, threaten to kill them, then say lurid comments about f***ing pussy.
We're not social workers. No, we I don't smoke. Give me money. The shop is up there. We've no money either. We don't get paid till Friday. We've no money till Friday. We don't get paid here. There's no cash here. What do you have? Nothing. You have nothing. We have nothing. Yeah, you get nothing from me. I'm going to f you come and beg you for yes. anything. Yeah, yeah. If you beg anything, I'll kill you. Go and leave the building, please. Yeah, in this clip, a migrant sits next to a woman on a bus and tells her to suck it, whilst pointing his finger at her. Suck it. Suck it. Suck it. Another clip shows a refugee drunk and leaving litter in the street. There's a bin there, look. There's a bin there, look. Keep on look, me look. I was drinking. Why you get the shop? Where is he living? Through the park? I don't you know. You get the shop? The bushes. You don't give me free dog. the fuck up. You don't give me free dog. He's not business. They're getting the real refugees a bad name here. This gentleman was accused of entering Temple Street Children's Hospital, telling security he wanted to sexually touch children. When he was told to leave, he allegedly sexually harassed the female staff. Later that day, some young girls accused him of harassing them on Talbot Street. Eventually, some locals caught up with the gentleman and they weren't happy. Look, okay, that's what happens at Dorothy Pedos. Several clips online show trouble within the asylum seeker accommodation. This gentleman was unhappy that he missed his breakfast. They used to fucking afford with me. I know, look, look what he must be. He must, I didn't get my breakfast. I didn't get my breakfast. I will show you what I will. Don't touch me, please. Don't touch me. Don't touch me. And my other friend too. Don't touch me. Outside this migrant center, the guard took after one young man because he stabbed another. Look, they're just putting someone in. Send me an ambulance. There is an armed response unit. Yeah. In another, a mass brawl broke out between the migrants and security had to calm the situation. Garda. Garda, come on, Garda. So with my time here in Dublin, I really wanted to see what the protests were like for myself. So this evening, there happens to be a protest in East Wall, so I'm going to head down there and see exactly what's going on for myself. Malachi, these protests, which I hear happen every Wednesday, do you think they're a positive thing? Are they having a good impact? Well, I think you can see from the crowd here and the, the vibrancy and the noise and the, the music, in fact, that people are very enthused to be here. And this is ordinary people in this country, ordinary working class people, rising up and saying enough is enough, that we don't have the capacity for another 70,000 people to come into the country from, our, from anywhere nor do we have the capacity to take in 70,000 uh, last year. <clears throat> we have a country which at every level of society is broken. We have 11,500 people in emergency accommodation. We have tens of thousands on housing waiting lists. We have a million people on hospital waiting lists. We have 100,000 children waiting on mental health assessments. We have tens of thousands of children waiting on serious medical um, operations. And yet this government is fixated on increasing the population when we don't have the capacity to sustain the people who are already here. So we started this march in East Wall and it's like we've seen in all the videos online. It's very peaceful, even when agitators have turned up it's remained peaceful. What they do is they walk around Dublin in the inner city, they'll stop at a place for 15 minutes just to cause a bit of disruption, but not to actually shut the city down. And actually, the people in cars seem quite supportive. They're happy to sit for 15 minutes and wait because they realize this is such a big issue. We've spoken to some people here and they're saying this is now the topic of the day. This is what people talk about in pubs, in cafes, at school, 
at work, in the house. This is Ireland's main talking point right now. At the end of the protest, Malachi Steenson, a Dublin-based community activist, spoke to the crowd at Five Lamps. You can see every day that there's more areas coming out around the country. You can see again today, even though the Irish media ignore us, we have British media here tonight. There's European media watching this. This is the big issue around the world. All of a sudden, behind us, the crowd erupted in shouts and screams. A car was deliberately driven through the crowd, knocking one protester to the ground. This is a guy who's been at protests since last week, causing trouble. The guards were told tonight that he should be removed and they argued he had a right to protest and we've no problem with that. He's after driving through the crowd here and hitting an elderly man. Now that's attempted murder. That's what the left is doing in this country. That's Antifa. This is these fascists who are trying to stop us legitimately protesting. They're prepared. They tried it at RTE on Saturday to drive over people and now there's a man seriously injured on the ground. <laughs> Behind me is the sad end to an incredibly peaceful protest. We followed it the entire way and at no point has anyone here been an agitator. Unfortunately, there's been one well-known left-wing activist in the area who has antagonised the crowd throughout the way and unfortunately, at the very end, has gone through the crowd in his Jeep and as you can see behind me, an ambulance has been required. This has been Carl Smiles for Rebel News here in Dublin, Ireland. So covering the migrant crisis, both home and abroad, doesn't come cheap. We've got the cheapest hotel we could find, we flow on economy class tickets, and we can't do it without your help. So please, we go where the mainstream media won't, and we can't do it without you. So head over to migrantreports.co.uk, share all our content, but most importantly, where you can, chip in and help out with the costs. Thank you.